Welcome to uh, our last presentation of the year. <clears throat> We're very excited that you're here um, and thank you for joining. So my name is Claire Eagle and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Historic New Harmony. Uh, Historic New Harmony is a unified program of the University of Southern Indiana and the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites. Uh, what I do uh, mostly is further connect uh, the town of New Harmony with the University of Southern Indiana. And that brings us um, to, to one of the reasons that we're doing this series. Uh, Crossroads, uh, this Crossroads speaker series uh, was uh, originally planned to be held in the spring in conjunction with a uh, Smithsonian Museum on Main Street exhibit that we were to host in partnership with Indiana Humanities. Uh, that exhibit, Crossroads Change in Rural America, unfortunately, was canceled uh, due to the, the shutdown that we experienced due to the pandemic. But we still wanted to move forward uh, with this speaker series for several reasons. Um, and the, the biggest being that these uh, subjects are just as important and just as relevant as we continue um, in this new socially distant world. Uh, a few housekeeping things before we continue. Uh, please keep yourself muted while Kevin gives his uh, presentation. Uh, there will be a, a portion at the end uh, where he might ask some questions, or if you have any questions of him, we can, uh, we can maybe speak up a little bit. But if there's anything you absolutely have to share while the presentation is being given, please share that in the chat. Uh, this presentation is being recorded uh, and will be posted to our Historic New Harmony playlist on the USI YouTube page uh, within the next few days. Uh, hopefully uh, by the end of the weekend. So if you have to leave early for any reason or are having connection issues, don't worry about missing anything. All right, so tonight we have Kevin McKelvey. He's an associate professor in English and the director of the University of Indianapolis's Masters in Social Practice of Art program. Uh, we uh, found Kevin in this presentation through the Indiana Humanities uh, Speakers Bureau uh, that they, uh, uh, put in place as part of the inseparable initiative that was also part of the Crossroads exhibit that we were to host. Kevin is a place-based writer, poet, designer, and social practice artist. His poetry book, Dream Wilderness, was published last year and another book, Indiana Nocturnes, written with Cur Curtis Chrysler, will be published this year. Uh, he's at work on a novel and regularly completes workshops, art installations, and placemaking projects around Indiana. At the University of Indianapolis, he serves as an associate professor, as I mentioned, as well as the director of the Masters in Social Practice of Art program. Uh, Kevin grew up on the edge of a cornfield near Lebanon, Indiana, and attended DePaul University and Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Kevin. Didn't, no, yeah. Uh, thank you, thanks for introducing me and thanks for having me tonight, glad to be here. So I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, and before I do that, uh, there is a, a little bit of participa participation at the end. You might need like a pen and paper, pencil and paper uh, uh, to jot some notes down. So. Uh, if you need to get up to get that or just kind of be ready for that uh, uh, after this uh, introductory part. Let's see how to just do that. Maybe. I don't know if that's the best. Um, and so this uh, uh, presentation is about arts, community, and place. And hopefully it's more of a collaborative workshop by the end. Uh, just not me talking to you for the next uh, 55 minutes. Uh, ideally, we can come out of come out of here with some ideas and, and activations um, and for for New Harmony and the surrounding area. Uh, so I'm part of uh, this is sponsored by the Indiana Humanities Council, who uh, done a lot of I've done a lot of great work with them personally. I know they do do all kinds of amazing things around the state. And now I can't even get it to work. Um, you know, so so any any discussion of place really should begin with the native peoples who were here before us. Um, you know, in the case of Indianapolis, where I am, and, and New Harmony, uh, that's the Miami uh, and Shawnee, uh, the Kickapoo, um, uh, parts of the Delaware and Lenape, um, in in those cultures. And so, you know, they had you know it's a culture. They had artwork, um, 
Uh, this is pretty, uh, the, the, the bear, bear skin on, on the right, uh, the robe is, is pretty, um, pretty typical for the Miami artwork uh, that's seen in many different ways. Um, and, and I think it also, we wanna talk about the land itself. Uh, when Indiana was settled, uh, the map on the right really kind of shows, you know, there's this, there's a saying that a squirrel could essentially walk from uh, uh, the Ohio River to the Michigan state line and never touch the ground. Uh, Indiana was totally forested, except for some spots in the Northwestern part of the state where there was prairie, um, uh, you know, new, uh, new Harmony area. There was some magnificent, huge, huge, huge trees. Um, and, I, and I especially love that our state seal is, is a white man cutting down a tree and chasing off a buffalo. Uh, buffalo were common in Indiana uh, 200 years ago, uh, but, but not so much anymore. Um, uh, you know, so around uh, New Harmony, we, there's Harmony State Park uh, just, just down the road, uh, the Wabash River just down the street. Uh, Beale Woods is a place in Illinois uh, where you can see uh, probably more than likely virgin timber uh, or at least old growth. So trees that are very similar to what New Harmony looked like uh, 200 years ago. Another great thing around New Harmony is the oxbows and islands. Uh, you can really see the curves of the Wabash um, in those islands and, and oxbows. Um, and then as well as you have the cypress swamps down there, the twin swamps and goose ponds. So there's really a lot of interesting natural areas around that, that are reflective of uh, the state uh, before um, before basically we cut it all down, you know. And so you know you want to, uh, you know, part of this land acknowledgement um, is pretty much all of Indiana was clear cut. Uh, you know, there's like something like 24 million acres, and maybe a thousand acres wasn't clear cut. You know, so so any big tree you see now, more than likely, uh, was a sapling um, 200 years ago, um, and we are recovering some of those some of those natural areas uh, and so i kind of want to talk about some of the people you probably know already james wick and riley um you know at, at the time of his death was more famous really than anyone in the united states uh, there's things all over the united states named after him after his death um, he was a great public speaker uh, so much so that mark twain didn't want to give lectures with him uh, because riley was such a, a great orator uh, you know, and, and he's kind of forgotten now, sort of known in, in Indiana, but again, an important part of that early culture of Indiana. Um, another person is Gene, Gene Stratton Porter, um, who grew up uh, on the Limberlost, which is a huge swamp when she was a girl. And over the course of her lifetime, it was drained into farmland. Uh, and she's known for her novels, uh, but it turns out she's also, she also pioneered ways uh, to take photographs of butterflies and moths. Um, she got into movies and was uh, really pretty famous. I mean, if you can kind of think of like John Green or somebody like that now, like she was that famous um, a century ago. Uh, T.C. Steele, we know him and, and his painting, uh, uh, his impressionist paintings from around Indiana. And he represented a whole school of painters who painted um, in this style and, you know, kind of going back to Steele and Riley and a whole bunch of other authors uh, and painters from this time, you know, there's a rich, rich culture uh, of writing kind of uh, around the turn of the century uh, up, up until a century ago. Kind of that next generation is someone like Jessamine West, uh, famous for uh, The Friendly Persuasion and other novels and stories set around Paoli um, and embracing Quaker history. Um, we have Marguerite Young uh, who lived in New Harmony for a while uh, but also in New, New York and Greenwich Village and traveled all over the world, known for no novels and poems and essays. Uh, of course, Kurt Vonnegut, very famous here in Indianapolis uh, for his novel stories and essays. And we have Robert Indiana, you know, his love sculpture, a lot of his other artwork. Um, but again, just, and he's from, I think from Newcastle, you know, so there's a whole host of people in Indiana um, who are from small towns like New Harmony or from Indianapolis or Fort Wayne or, or South Bend or whatever, who, who went on to produce a lot of important artwork in many different genres. Um, you know, we also have Etheridge Knight, uh, a famous poet from Indianapolis, um, kind of famous for 
uh, learning poetry in prison uh, and is kind of considered this prison poet, uh, but uh, writing about the civil rights movement, uh, violence against black people, uh, just any number of issues, uh, you know, quite a, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, another sort of contemporary of his in Indianapolis is Mari Evans, uh, who also wrote poetry, uh, mainly known for her poetry, but also a very important uh, literary critic and, and essayist. And she also did plays, children, children's books, um, and, and television. Uh, and so this kind of gets us to, you know, part of what I want to talk about is it's not just dead white people who we can read and and learn from, you know, there's kind of this long history of, of many different kinds of authors and painters and, and artists from Indiana. And then we have a lot of contemporary work going on right now. Uh, Kyle, Rag, Kyle, Kyle Ragsdale is a painter in Indianapolis. I know there's a lot of artists in, in New Harmony. Uh, Quincy Owens is another uh, sculptor and painter here in Indianapolis, who does a lot of interesting site-based work. Uh, and Bruce Snyder uh, grew up in Columbia City, uh, up in the northern part of the state. And he's a poet, uh, really, uh, really love his work quite a bit. Um, oh yeah, there's like five other people I should put on here. Uh, Aaron Michael Morales uh, writes novels and stories. He grew up in Terre Haute, just right up the road, right up the road from you guys. Um, and uh, I put Lori Raider Day on here because she went to my rival high school. So I went to Lebanon High School and, and she went to Western Boone High School. Um, uh, she writes mysteries. Uh, she's uh, had quite a bit of success with that. One of her classmates is Christopher Koch, uh, who also went to Weibo, as we call it. Um, uh, and he's a, he's a novelist and, and short story writer as well. Um, Adrian Matika uh, grew up in Indianapolis uh, and teaches at IU Bloomington now. Uh, and he was recently uh, poet laureate of, of Indiana um, and is doing a lot of really interesting work in, in a lot of different realms of, of poetry. And I, I got to put John Green on here because uh, he's, he's famous um, and had some success as a novelist and along with along with his movies. Um, you know, but, but I make that connection back to somebody like Gene Stratton Porter or James Wick and Riley. Um, you know, the, 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 the sort of fame that, that he has now was, was rivaled by, by those two and, and, and possibly some others. Um, I need to meet, uh, mention Matthew Graham as well. Uh, he's a new poet laureate of Indianapolis, uh, literally right down the road from you guys. Um, uh, and so, you know, so, so you know, I kind of bring all these up that, that, you know, poetry and art and writing is very much alive in the state. It's not just something that happens in New York. Uh, or, or Indianapolis, it can happen anywhere. And it's a great way to contribute to uh, local culture uh, in, in whatever form that that artwork and creativity uh, takes. And so I wanna talk a little bit more uh, about place. And so we can define place a lot of different ways. And, and I think part of what hopefully we can do tonight is get you thinking about place in all the ways that it can be defined. You know, it's not just a physical location, um, or, or an address or a building. A uh, place can be a lot of different things. Uh, and we also want to talk about the term placemaking uh, because that's kind of this fancy term that's taken on a lot of different meanings and maybe is a little colonialist and maybe a little uh, privileged. Um, and it's definitely been used to displace people from um, uh, uh, definitely been used for uh, gentrification and those sorts of things. But, but ideally, it's when artists, arts organizations, and community development practitioners, as they say, um, you know, integrate arts and culture and into community revitalization work. Um, and so there's, there's negative aspects of it, uh, you know, like let's, when things are just it's like put in a sculpture, or put in a mural, and you're just kind of art washing a new development. But there's real ways to make it work as, as um, creating culture and really enhancing uh, quality of life for the people who live in that place. And there's this other term called place keeping um, where it's more about not changing a place because place making assumes that the people who live there don't have a place or haven't made that place good enough to, to, to use air quotes. And so, um, I, I like this idea of place keeping better because it's really about activating 
and caring for that place for the people who live there, who are already part of the culture there and, and who want to do more uh, and create more um, of, of that culture. And so that gets to the people, uh, the people who live there um, in, in any place. Um, and it's not just the rich people or the white people or the artists or, or you know, kind of the upper class people or the privileged people, you know, to, to, for a place to really thrive, it needs to engage every person who lives there um, and, and, and include those people in this culture making. And, and that's really what it's about. Like a good place has culture. Uh, and, and cultures, and it can be different kinds of cultures, cultures for, for all people. There's all kinds of subcultures, all kinds of, of ways to, to engage those people. And some of, the, some of the examples I have later are about these different kinds of cultures and how you can turn them, how you can turn them into art. Uh, this is a great graph from the Project for Public Spaces. It's very small, I know. Um, I should, well, good thing they cited it. Now that you're putting this on the web, I should probably have better, <laughs> better citation, but uh, they have their logo down there and you can find this on their website. Um, and, and so we, we start to think of places as just kind of like a single use place or a, a place for just uh, one kind of person. Um, and what this graph does or the circle does is it really gives us a lot of ways to think through places. Um, and, and so they have kind of the measurements on the outer ring and like how people use it, things you can measure, things you can look up, like crime statistics or rent levels or um, you know, volunteer rates. Uh, and then it has a lot of intangibles in that middle ring um, that, that get to things like if a place is walkable or, or people can sit there, but how close it is or how interactive it is. And then that gets to those four, those four areas, you know, making a place social, making it uh, like having activities, um, you know, is it getting to comfort? Is it comfortable? Does it look good? Is it clean? Um, as well as access and, and, and linking. And that linking can be sidewalks, it can be bus service. You know, for, for a place like New Harmony, a lot of your linkages are outside of town to the other small towns nearby or, or farther afield, uh, like Evansville. Uh, and, and so, Project for Public Spaces also has a couple other ideas that I think are really important. One is the power of 10 plus, um, where any good place has 10 things to do. Uh, and those 10 things, you know, they can't, they're typically free and they can, you can see in the, uh, you know, it can be seating, it can be shade, it can be a public restroom, uh, it can be games, you know, it doesn't have to be a big expensive uh, stage or festival or, or sculpture. It can, and, and that gets to their lighter, quicker, cheaper um guidelines uh where it's you know just try out ideas um you know try things that are cheaper um you know they don't have to be built in or you know you don't have to pour a bunch of concrete uh to to do to to, to have a project uh you know there's a lot of ways to to do things pretty pretty cheaply and they have a ton of uh, online resources um I'm, I'm glad i didn't link link to them because they just like totally redid their website and uh uh, and some of their approaches. So, so I'm pretty excited about what they're doing, but, but they've really been at this for 10 to 20 years or over 10 years, but in uh, closer to 20, 20 plus years uh, uh, and have done, have all kinds of resources and project examples that are, that are really fantastic. Um, and so, so a lot of things that, that, um, that, that placemaking deals with is not necessarily just art making or music festivals or sculpture, you know, really placemaking at its heart should really deal with things that, that every community faces. And so a lot of that has to do with education and jobs, uh, trauma, um, health and wellness, uh, mental health, uh, food, food security and housing. Uh, and so, you know, for, uh, you know, and, and these issues are in every place. You know, in New Harmony, in the township you're in, uh, in the rural areas around you, as well as in Indianapolis or Chicago or, or New York. Um, and, and so if you're taking care of people in this way, you're, you're really helping them contribute to the culture uh, that you have in your community. And so a lot of these issues that come up from those, from the previous slide are things like walking. Can people walk? Um, 
uh, do they have a golf cart in New Harmony to, <laughs> to drive around? Um, driving, how safe are the streets uh, uh, for kids to ride bikes on? Uh, you know, do you have a problem with, with seniors who can't drive or, or need ways to get to stores and those sorts of things? And that's where connectivity comes in, uh, kind of connecting people with transportation or communication or other services uh, within the town. Um, and that leads to issues around food security um, and access to food, uh, which, which is problematic in some, time, some towns because of the, kind of the Walmartization of places where you just have these big box stores that are far away. Um, but other activities can be enrichment just for fun, uh, some maybe related to job training, maybe related to some sort of um, artwork or, or, or creativity. You want to try to have, uh, you want to try to think of how ways to engage different generations of people, you know, kind of make, connecting youth and, uh, and those over 65 uh, and, and people in between at different stages of life, because a lot of families um, have multiple generations that they're, they're trying to engage. Um, and so that comes to, to art, arts, culture, and creativity. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a gallery. It doesn't have to be um, a, a theater performance. Uh, you know, the, the, the architecture, some of that has to do architecture of sidewalks and, and, and infrastructure, but also just how buildings look and how uh, kind of, you know, people like places that, that look good or, and or are visually uh, appealing. Um, access to healthcare is another thing uh, that can be uh, kind of the core value of placemaking, just making sure people have um, some of that healthcare access uh, that, that they may not be able to get otherwise. Uh, you know, one thing is to connect to natural areas, uh, you know, kind of within town or outside of town, because, uh, you know, a big culture of, of natural areas there, you know, there's quite a few subcultures there um, who are sometimes at odds. You know, you have hikers and birders and, and tree huggers, and then you have hunters and, and uh, boaters and, and those kinds of things. And, and what's crazy, even though they are not necessarily aligned, they, f they fight and work for a lot of the same things. Um, and, and so a lot of the natural areas we have today, especially down around you guys along the Wabash, is because of duck hunters and, and Ducks Unlimited. And so, so there can be some um, there can be some some allies there that you wouldn't normally think of. Um, uh, people like to sit down, and they like to not sweat when they sit down. So so thinking of places where you have seating and shade, <clears throat> even if it's you know just if it's portable or if it's a bench, um, you know because you know if somebody. Elderly, elderly comes to to your event, um, or somebody with with mobility issues, they're going to want to sit down, and, the, and it's going to they, they're going to want a sturdy space to sit down. And the um, and then the other thing is fun and games. Like people like to play games, they like to have fun. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know. Can, uh, there's a lot of different ways to to gamify a lot of activities. Um, Another, another useful way to think through this, I don't know, hopefully you guys can see this, it's kind of small, but, but this is from Art Place America. Uh, and they funded uh, 200, almost 300 uh, placemaking projects uh, between 2010 and, and 2020. And so this is a grid that they came up with uh, to help people develop projects and, and think through projects. And so you can see here, um, your one idea uh, for, for one thing really should try to include two or three things on, on the left, and then, and then also consider how you engage uh, the five things across the top. And so, you know, there's a lot of connections between like agriculture and food um, and, and something like health uh, or workforce development. Um, other areas are economic development, education and youth, environment and energy, uh, housing, immigration, public safety, and transportation. And so if you're thinking of placemaking, um, you know, a lot of times it's just, you know, you're just kind of thinking of um, kind of one pro or one solution to one problem. But uh, a lot of times the solution can take care of quite a few different problems. And so this gives you, uh, this gives you a way <clears throat> to think through some of your needs and, and, and problems and solutions uh, and how they, how they intersect and how they, how they connect. Um, it's also important, I think, to, to think through um, uh, the, the, the categories across the top. 
in terms of, of civ civic, social, and faith-based organizations within the area, uh, businesses within the area, uh, government, uh, uh, nonprofits, and philanthropy. So, so a lot of these places are, are partners, they are funders. Um, you know, if you, if you need a space, um, churches and libraries almost always have a space that can be used, that can be used for something. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of grants uh, uh, through through government. There's a lot of grants through philanthropy uh, or um, you know other statewide organizations like the Indiana Arts Commission. And then, um, so you want to be thinking, you know, so a lot of art interventions are passive, and it's more about the audience, and it's more about being being an, an observer. Uh, like you go to a gallery and you look at the painting, which is great. I love to do it and other people do too. But, but that gallery door is a big barrier to a lot of people who live in New Harmony. Uh, you know, like that's, that's for upper class people or people who know about art. And so, you, you know, the idea is to kind of take artwork outdoors or to the people who need it or don't think they need it, but, but uh, it, it is for the people who need it. So you want to be thinking of things that are active, that are more about the community and less about the audience or less about uh, people who are going to buy a painting or that kind of thing. And then also turning, turning those, those audience members or those observers, turning them into a, into a participant. How can they participate um, in whatever that activity is? Because then it's not just, they're not just seeing culture, they're, they're creating culture by, by participating in it. Um, and so you want to think of, of activation, interaction, juxtaposition uh, and, and inclusion uh, uh, as, a, as a way to, to engage more people kind of across ages, across socioeconomic class, those kinds of things. Um, you know, make it interactive, put genres or, or, or uh, art, art genres or, or different things together. Um, and so I have a few examples here, kind of running out of time. Um, so Big Car uh, is a group I work with in, in, in Indianapolis. I know they're doing some, some stuff in New Harmony as well. Um, they've taken over this vacant space and turned it into a tube factory art space. Um, a few years ago, <clears throat> I helped them with this garden on a parking lot, a uh, really fun project uh, for me. Uh, and I know they're doing social alchemy uh, uh, down in New Harmony uh, as, as well. Uh, another project is House Life Project by Meredith Brickell here in Indianapolis. Uh, she just took over a vacant house and like just had weekly programming at the house like she'd show up with food and activities there might have been a little bit of artwork hanging in the house um, or interpreted in the house uh, but it was a way to engage neighbors and artists uh, together um, another is project reclaim here in indianapolis um, by lashana crow storm and phyllis boyd uh, again taking over vacant lots um, and just they put in some garden beds they have these these sheds in the back to, to, to reclaim the space and, and activate, activate the space. Um, another artist I really love here in Indianapolis is Stuart Hyatt. Um, he's there behind the mask and the, the mesh, but, but he kind of juxtaposes, juxtaposes recordings and sound recordings with music uh, and just does a lot of really interesting things um, between the natural world and the built environment to turn that into to music and sound. Like he just finished a pro project recording bats and then kind of using that uh, to, to turn it into music. Um, Exhibit Columbus, uh, not too far away from you guys. Um, it has a lot of inspiration, I think, from New Harmony um, about um, using the built environment, using this history of architecture in the city to then have um, uh, new, new people come in and create artwork and interactions uh, within, uh, within the city. Another uh, I love is Typical New Arts Federation and the mural projects they've been doing uh, kind of a, around Lafayette in their, their service area for the Arts Commission. Uh, so this is a, a, just a big giant grain tower in, in uh, Fowler, Indiana. Uh, and it's got this beautiful spray painted uh, uh, wheat, uh, uh, wheat grass on it with, with seeds. Uh, they've done Wabash walls, kind of these, these um, flood walls along the Wabash in Lafayette. Uh, this is another one in Greencastle, uh, big, you know, again, just grain silos, uh, but th this really represents the town. There's a lot of murals that don't really represent the town um, in, a, in a way that I think, you know, shows why the town is unique. Um, 
Uh, this is something I'd love a lot is Worm Farm Institute's uh, fer fermentation fest and the farm art detour. Um, so this is an old John Deere combine uh, that, that an artist lit up with, with uh, stained glass. And, and the, the, the town where it was set up loved it so much that they, they fundraised to make it permanent, uh, to winterize it uh, for the Wisconsin winters. Uh, just, just love this so much. And so, so Worm Farm, had, like they basically set up artwork in farm fields and this is rural nor northern Wisconsin. And so basically people just drive around to these spots and look at this artwork. And so it's a way to kind of get people to connect and drive around and visit these little towns and visit the diners and, and restaurants and, and those kinds of things. Um, and so it's a way to activate a space that really isn't used um, you know, between October and, and April. And it gives, you know, really engages a lot of uh, local neighbors and that's crossing cultures. You know, it's in farmers, farm fields, um, and, you know, and that's a, that's a, that's a, a culture that isn't normally embraced for, for artistic work, but they've, they've certainly embraced it, embraced it here. Um, another subculture I love to uh, talk about is dirt track racing. Uh, and so this is M12 collective, uh, and they just, one of their art projects was having a race car for all these dirt track races and, and things. Um, and, and so again, that's like, you know, farmers, dirt track racers, these other subcultures, hunters, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of subcultures that, that can be engaged uh, beyond just the normal kind of artistic patron uh, or tourist or, or, or that kind of thing that, that can really contribute to local culture. Um, uh, maybe this will work. I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to hopefully it'll work. But this is called Trash Dance by Allison Orr. She's a choreographer who worked with um, Austin, city of Austin uh, in Texas and their, their, um, their sanitation department. And so she chore uh, choreographed this whole dance with, um, I'll get, just kind of show you the end. She choreographed this whole dance with like the trash men and women and, and, and the trash trucks and trash equipment. And again, kind of this, this culture that, uh, that really isn't normally thought of as artistic, but they, they use their creative abilities to, uh, to uh, create this amazing piece. Um, another real favorite is Deveron Projects, uh, which is uh, based in a little town in Scotland. Um, and they've been doing this work for 20 years. Uh, and really a lot of the, you know, kind of this small farming town and mining town that kind of just like the mining went away, the farming reduced. And so they've been doing this town as the venue. Uh, uh, where there's just kind of art projects all over town, anywhere, everywhere, kind of all the time um, in storefront windows and houses and barns and all kinds of places. Uh, and, and they've started the town as the garden um, to uh, address food and food security. Uh, so they have this idea of shadow curating where it's kind of curating uh, behind the scenes. And, and they, they've also done the maps to kind of connect people in different ways uh, with the with the art trails uh, around around the town, uh, and so that kind of gets us to to New Harmony and the participation part of of the session. Um, so um, so this is the time to get out your pen and paper. Um, there's no quiz at the end, but but I want to work through a worksheet I usually do at this um, at this talk I give. Um, here it is. Big 11, big 11 by 17 piece of paper um, to, to hopefully work through some of these aspects of, of placemaking and placekeeping. Um, and I know a lot of that's already happening in, happening in New Harmony. Uh, it has been for, for decades. Uh, you know, and so, um, so hopefully I can offer something new uh, to you guys. And so, so you wanna be thinking um, about what makes New Harmony unique. Um, that's pretty easy because of the utopias that are there and all, all the amazing uh, uh, architecture and, and sculpture, and kind of the long history of artists in, in New Harmony. Um, you know, and, and, and I want, what I mean by unique is like the, the only, like the thing that New Harmony has that nobody else has. Uh, you know, what, what is that? You know, I mean, there's another Shaker Village and, you know, these other kinds of things and there's other sort of art, artist colony places. And so be thinking of that, what really makes um, New Harmony unique in, in your mind. Um, and so, 
you know, part of, part of what makes good placemaking um, is working with, um, starting with the problems and the people. What makes bad placemaking is starting with the artist and what the artist wants to do. <clears throat> so the, the, you know, good placemaking, good placekeeping is a result of, is a result of responding to the problems and needs of the people who live there. Um, you know, and so, so I want you to start just kind of on your notebook, just start with problems. Um, and, and this is just kind of write down some issues. Oh, and it might help to kind of like set up a little bit of a grid on your, on your paper. So you kind of have issues. That's what I did on this, just issues kind of down here. Uh, you know, so maybe just kind of write down some of the issues, uh, opportunities, challenges, needs, uh, problems, absences, successes, ideas, or projects that, that interest you. Um, uh, you know, maybe you have questions or maybe a lot of questions, but, um, but this is kind of like New Harmony or Posey County, um, you know, maybe the greater Evansville metro area, but, but really just kind of New Harmony and, and Posey County. And, 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 and these are things that interest you, are important to you. And again, it can really kind of be anything, uh, opportunities, challenges, needs, um, um, absences is another way to think about it, successes, ideas, or projects. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to, uh, to think through some of those. Okay, and so the next thing uh, we want to be thinking about, maybe, oops, yeah, power. Um, you know, if you're here tonight, um, you know, you probably have some power, you have some privilege, um, you know, even if you don't think you do. Um, and, and power comes in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, some of that's from money or elected position. Um, you know, maybe you own a business, uh, maybe you own a farm. Um, or, or, you know, even own a house, um, you know, or, or have a storefront or, or something like that. And so, so power can be defined in a lot of ways as, as your arts practices, your academic interests, your skills, um, your hobbies, um, community interests or cultural interests, uh, relevant childhood experiences, uh, personality traits, like maybe you're really outgoing and really like to, like to talk to people. Um, and so really this is just the list and you can kind of put this off, off, off to the bottom. This doesn't have to go on your grid. You can kind of go below or on a separate paper, but, but it's really just like all the things you're good at um, or, the, or that make you who, who you are. Um, uh, this also might be a thing where you can write some things that you want to get better at. But you know, for me, I mean, I think like I can write really well. Um, you know, I'm not a, not a great public speaker, uh, but I have a lot of different interests in ecology and art. Um, in place and in architecture. Um, I can also do carpentry and, and landscaping, um, which mostly just gets me into trouble with, with Big Car and, and other artists, but uh, that's how you end up with a parking lot on a, on a or a garden on a parking lot. Um, and so just thinking through those things, um, you know, and sometimes with those uh, childhood experiences or, or cultural interests, there's ways that those, those come into play. Um, you know, like for me, you know, like I grew up out in the country, you know, I grew up canning, gardening, all these kinds of things. And so those, you really never know how those things are going to um, come, uh, you know, you never know how these abilities are going to 
need to be used in, in one of these projects. So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes for that. And, and so another another way to, to think about these things that you're good at um, is is in, in is, is your privilege, um, and and that privilege can can be used um, a lot a lot of different ways. Um, but really, kind of thinking of your privilege um, and, and what that is and what it means, um, you know, whether whether it can you know you know if it if if you're intentional about that or understand, understand your privilege, uh, if you abuse your privilege, um, you know, these are all things that we need to consider um, as artists, um, as, as white people, uh, the, the, the really kind of understanding that is really important to doing good placemaking work because a lot of placemaking work um, kind of ends or kind of is subsumed by this idea of the charity visitor. Um, which is an article comes from an article from Jane Adams uh, in the Atlantic Monthly in 1899 uh, about the sub subtle problems of charity, um, and it's you know it's essentially about upper class white people doling out charity based on their own judgments and their own values, and so you know none of the projects that you should really undertake in New Harmony aren't really about charity, um, you know you know that. If you're going into it as, as, as an act of charity, that creates a power dynamic uh, between you and other people that, that isn't really uh, conducive to, to good placemaking work. And, you know, so, so ideally you're going into things as an equal, uh, as an artist uh, you know, who has some privilege but can use that privilege to, to engage and empower others. Um, the next thing we wanna think about are the people. Um, and, and, and who is most affected by your issue? Um, and so this is where we kind of get more into those, those as, um, um, uh, aspects of power and privilege. You know, so who is most affected by your issue? And this is where the grid helps. So you can kind of have your issues. The next column over um, is, is people uh, who's, yeah, gotta look at my, my cheat sheet, um, is the people, who are the people affected by by those issues or problems. And this is where you can maybe write a little bit more, who's in a position of power, um, uh, who's marginalized or voiceless. Um, you know, something you can do as an artist or a community member or placemaker is use your privilege to connect, to connect people, to connect, to connect these groups, to give voice to the voiceless. And, and if your problem or your solution isn't engaging with the marginalized or the voiceless, then you're not really helping. Then you're part of the problem. So, so just think through a couple minutes on on who these groups are. Um, you know, and it's kind of like kind of three here. Like who's most affected, who's in a position of power or privilege, and then who's marginalized or voiceless for for this for this issue.
Okay, so we'll go next to the need. Um, and, and for the people most affected by this issue, what is their greatest need? Um, what can you fulfill as an artist? What needs may seem tangential or too large to tackle? Um, you know, what are some simple needs or how can fulfilling a small tangible need solve a, solve a bigger need? Um, and so, you know, like I think um, Marianne wrote in the chat, attracting more artists who want to live here. Okay, you know, so it's, you know, so it's kind of like, so the question is like, why don't artists want to want to live there? You know, is it, is, I don't know, you don't have a wine bar or, or, or a paint store or, you know, is it, is it, uh, you know, lack of, lack of shopping or, um, um, you know, or lack of a school, you know, so it's, so it's that kind of thing. Um, yeah, affordable housing, you know, kind of thinking through, through those kinds of things that, um, um, you know, so sometimes it's those simple things that kind of take care of these, these bigger issues. And, and so that gets to the place, like where, like, where can you address this need? Um, and place can really be, um, you know, we, we think, we think of it as a, as a building, um, but place can be a space and it can be indoors, a park, a library, an intersection, a, st a vacant building, sidewalk, church, alley, school, um, a public space, a field, um, you know, places everywhere. So so is there someplace in New Harmony or nearby where you can um, think that this, um, this need could be addressed? And maybe it's not really a place. A place can also be online. It can be, um, you know, citywide, townwide, town um, you know, or, or it can be a very specific place. Yeah, and to Dan's comment, you know, like the machine can be the place, you know, like it can be this sort of, you know, amorphous thing that that's in place to uh, to help attract people to uh, to stay in New Harmony. And so this is kind of getting to two solutions um, is, is how can you engage people uh, in an equitable, inclusive way to address this need, you know, how do how do your other interests build into this? You know, like if you, I don't know, you know, if you want to plant trees or, you know, who, or or do any number of things, who do you know who has a, a skid steer, bobcat, backhoe, um, those kinds of things? There's all kinds of things to to address this to have activate places. It can be any kind of traditional genre. Um, that we know, painting cross rocks, um, doing a parade, a festival, uh, an archive, walking tours, meals, gardens, um, activism, you know, it doesn't even have to be art. I mean, I think that's part of it is it can, it can be um, organizing or, or any number of things. So, so kind of the next, next spot over on, on your, uh, on your grid there, you know, what are some possible activations or, or ways to empower people to, to do this?
take maybe uh, we'll take maybe 30 seconds a minute to finish up. And if you guys want to we'll kind of have just discussion here at the end. So if you want to share your ideas or ask questions or make suggestions or um, whatever, uh, just you can do that in the chat. You can uh, unmute and we, we can do it that way. Just whatever, uh, whatever works for you guys. Okay, so we'll, we'll just kind of open it up. Um, you know, we can start by talking by, about some of the uh, uh, problems um, or, or some of your solutions or, or some of the needs, kind of just wherever you guys want to start. Uh, I'll, I'll share something kind of just to start us off. Um, I know something that we've we've discussed um, even in this series uh, when Dr. Jett was presenting is that um, food uh, scarcity and um, uh, we're, we're considered a food desert, even with um, a Dollar General, it's still 15 to 20 minutes to any um, kind of typical typical grocery store, uh, which is, um, I think, um, not only a problem for those that live here, but I think also a problem in attracting um, more residents to New Harmony. There's not really a, <clears throat> a consistent or a sustainable vision for the town because I think there are def different definitions of what growth means. I think that there are some um, uh, wonderful, uh, uh, there's a lot, there's a percentage of, of town that would rather we not have tourists. And then there are a large percentage that understand that it's the tourist kind of keeping things moving forward. And so I don't know that we all agree on exactly what growth is. I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone says that we want a, a Starbucks uh, in town, um, but we do want places to eat and to shop. And um, we also uh, don't want to pigeonhole ourselves with one particular target market. We don't want to be, you know, the, the uppity art town. Uh, we, we want to actually New Harmony truly wants to inspire new artists and, um, and celebrate existing artists. And so that, that's, I think we, we have that covered, but um, until we all get on the same page, I, I don't know that we can move forward. Like I said in my comment, we have at least nine or 12 different entities in a town of 750 people. Um, there's no consistent power, if you will. And um, so there, there's an opportunity for all of us to come together, identify the three to five priorities. And I'll be honest, once we do, there's really nothing in our way. We have such an incredible space here. The uh, one more thing and I'll, I'll shut up, but you started off with what does New Harmony have and what makes it special? And it's to my other comment about, you know, we might not be diverse, but we're begging for that in many ways. It's the mix of people. We are very diverse here. It, diversity in my, my mind is diversity of thought, not necessarily black or white. And um, we definitely have that and it works very well. We have good discourse here, uh, which you don't have in the rest of our incredible country right now. Um, so I, we do have a mix of people, then we're always looking to add to it. Um, but that's to me is that is the magic of New Harmony is the people. But we have to have a plan. A 
other other needs, uh, solutions, problems. When you were asking about who, I've never thought about who who is voiceless in New Harmony. I I I I'm the wrong person to ask that because I'll talk to a tree. I, I love the people in this town, and I think that everyone bring, everyone is a wonderful character in this play that is Utopia. But the people who are voiceless in New Harmony are the older, poor white people, um, and I don't know that they feel welcomed uh, in the galleries. Or some sometimes the events that we put on have white tablecloths, and maybe you know we don't welcome getting barbecue on your white shirt, and that that's something we have to be cognizant of. And um, you know, there, there, there's definitely an opportunity there. Yeah, and, and a lot of times it's going to where those, you know, you go to where those people are. You know, if it's the church supper or uh, I can't remember the diner on on the main street, but you know, it's just kind of going to where they are and seeing seeing how you can engage them or or doing something that might that you know might interest them or engage them in some way. The other piece is, is truly, and I know there's no such thing, affordable housing. Um, affordable housing and activating our green space. If there's something that we can do soon is address that. Um, whether it's just decent apartments or townhouses or we become the epicenter for tiny homes, I don't know. Um, you know, I know they, they set out to to create affordable housing and they end up being $125,000, right? Every time, no matter how small, it's it's always incredibly expensive. But I don't know. We, we, we've, we've changed the world from this little place on the, the Wabash before, so why not again? Come on, Katie, come on, Timothy. We've got, and come on, Melody, we've got some incredible brains on this call. You said a great word, which was vision. And I'm curious, um, so I'm an Evans Pavilion, I'm a Detroit transplant. And uh, I participated a few years ago in a process in Evansville called uh, Voice. It was a really a community visioning process that allowed residents to envision what they saw in their preferred future for the community. And I'm wondering if um, New Harmony has ever discussed doing that kind of activity to help it figure out where it wants to be in a few years and then how to get there. Yeah, that, that's something that's really activated Indianapolis, uh, our quality of life plans. Um, and it's, it's kind of a year or two long process and it sounds very similar to um, what you did in Evansville, and, and maybe you knew, knew of some of those projects in Detroit, but it, it really is a way to kind of bring all these people together and just talk through kind of everything that, that Dan listed off. But but you know you know it's a way to to engage a lot of those different people and, and kind of and come up with some clear uh, clear steps forward that are agreed on by everyone, not the not the eight or ten people in charge or the the city council, county council, commissioners, whatever. Or you know whoever owns the, you know the most businesses in town, that kind of thing. On our uh, on our town's website, um, there is actually a vision document that's still listed there, and it was created in uh, and well, it was released in 2014. I don't know, Katie, if you were there or if Connie's on the call, but uh, I know I believe. Um, uh, it was actually driven by uh, USI uh, and other entities. And I know that there, the surveys were very, very broad. And so uh, we actually do have a, a very good document sitting out there. Now, I don't, I believe it was 2014. It actually, it might, it might've been like 2009 because I, I think um, Jane Blaffer Owen was involved regardless. Um, that a lot of those pieces, you go back and read it, and it's fascinating because a lot of them are, are, are still needs. Um, and uh, at the time, the, the school hadn't been closed and the bridge hadn't been closed. So there's definitely a, a third wave right now, and there are wonderful people in town uh, that are, are, I think, 
trying to figure out how to come together to activate thoughtfully, compassionately across the, the, the spectrum. Um, we're not there yet, but uh, we're, we're wanting to. So I, I don't know exactly what the next steps necessarily are besides coming together and, and whiteboarding, but uh, <laughs> you, you actually just nailed it. It's actually a quality of life plan so what the hell does that mean? And you know, what are the three to five constants that you can affect? Uh, Leslie just put a comment in the in the chat that I think we should um, we should definitely remember for the future. Uh, there's a program called Community Heart and Soul through the Orton Family Foundation. She thinks <laughs> that does a lot of grassroots community visioning. It's something to consider. Yeah, I. Uh... We had done some research on that for some other communities um, with historic Southern Indiana, um, and I think Connie's on here, but they're kind of related to uh, the the your town um, uh, model, but it is very much of a um, a grassroots, you know, as as uh, Kevin was saying, it's kind of going to where the people are, and you know, not doing something from the top you know, imposing what you think your vision should be. It's, you know, doing all sorts of things from um, putting up boards throughout the community with post-it notes and people writing down and, and really energizing kids and, and uh, senior citizens, all age groups. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, th that might be something that would be worthwhile looking into. They have a wonderful um, wonderful guide, and I know they do they do uh, free webinars a lot. Um, but again, it's it's a it's 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 totally a grassroots effort. You know, something I've been sitting here and thinking about is the meet in the street that a few businesses put together um, the last the last few uh, years. Um, and I know I know Mary Beth Gard, um, who's a member of member of our advisory board meeting um, kind of led that group. And it was this huge um, community dinner that, you know, we closed down a street, we had this huge long table. And I remember seeing people there at that table that I'd never seen in New Harmony before. And New Harmony is not that big. So I, it, it, it was an event that attracted um, people that might not come to say some of historic New Harmony's events. So I think that, you know, utilizing something that's already been done that our community has al already proven is successful and maybe a new way and, and reaching those, um, you know, those people, I think you said, go to the, where the people are, I think would be, would be um, very helpful for us and I think would work. Yeah, and there's a lot of, I mean, that kind of activating green spaces, you know, there's, there's ways that can be used to engage these people kind of where they are, you know, not that everybody has to come downtown, but, you know, if you go to the edge of the park on the south side of town and, you know, you know connect with those people, you know, or have pop-ups kind of around town, you know, or after church on Sunday or, or these various things just to kind of engage these people, um, you know, and so, and it sounds like uh, I was actually in, in town the weekend, you guys were setting up the table and, you know, it looked like an awesome event and, and, you know, and then it's like, how do you make it annual? How do you make it, you know, and I think that's you know, kind of getting that sustainability idea, you know, kind of you know, planning things in such a way that they can be, um, uh, they can be sustainable or, or an annual event um, because that's, that's creating culture. And, you know, the, the people that came that first year, you know, they're going to, and had a good experience, they're going to bring more people, you know, and then eventually you're going to need two long tables for, for the whole town to come. And so, those 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 ways to bring people together, you know, can be really powerful in ways that you don't really anticipate. So part of that machine in attracting families or in, in tr attracting people to come, not necessarily families, just people to come here and call it home and uh, help be a, be a part of the community, uh, whatever that machine is, um, it also drives the volunteers and most of the things that happen in New Harmony outside of historic New Harmony are volunteer driven. And at the last time I checked, the average age was like 56 or 57. 
And I, you know, I, I volunteer, the Kiwanis here are a fantastic group and they, they handle the food pantry. And um, many of the people working at the food pantry are over 70 and they work their tails off and they're loading and they're handing out. And, you know, the, but the reality is, is that one of our top five issues is we're about to age out of people who make the magic happen. So yes, that you know the the uh, meet on the street was a lovely event, but uh, you know that that took volunteers to make it happen, and so you know the the machine to to attract new residents feeds those other pieces too that are so critical, um, because we're like I say we're we're not far from aging out and burning out. I, I would just like to echo the need for a vision that you uh, initiated, Dan, in the, in the conversation. Um, because I feel I don't live in New Harmony. I adore it. I love the magic that Tim has talked about in the chat room. But I think my New Harmony is very different than the one you're describing, some of the locals there that probably feel ostracized from coming to the Athenaeum or, um, you know, in, into the red geranium even. It, it feels like it's a place where two worlds are um, almost in parallel or separate tracks and part of the vision is really finding a way to intersect that. That, that it, it, it feels to me like one world may just not even fathom what is what are the underpinnings of say the town world versus the tourist attraction world. And I think it needs to be an organic process that has people from both and it won't be easy. There, there will be a, a great diversity of, of uh, opinion on, on what that vision should be. I spent um, my first two retirement years, I decided I wanted to live near the ocean and I went to Beaufort, South Carolina, which um, is another very big tourist draw. It's, it's a beautiful Southern city near the ocean, but there was a huge resistance toward anything that would bring in more tourists and ruin the charm and ruin the small town. And I do think finding that balance here is a real challenge. You don't want high rises <laughs> on the main street, but it's got to be organic. It's got to incorporate those that perhaps we're not even talking with right now. Now I'll shut up. <laughs> I, I did want to ask Tim, when you mentioned uh, your Detroit roots, if mm -hmm. you had any familiarity with the Heidelberg project of Detroit. No. Oh, it's no, amazing. Check it out online. It's a Heidelberg Street was major inner city ghetto and an artist named Tyree Geaton yes. decided to mobilize the townspeople. Mm -hmm. All the houses are covered with polka dots yes. and items hanging in the trees. It's, it's just this little fantasy land of found objects mm -hmm. that a street that didn't want to be a, just, you know, a demoralized street, they all came together. It's, it's pretty phenomenal and I've never encountered it any place else. Heidelberg. You're absolutely right. Well, I think, uh, I think uh, this conversation has uh, given us all quite a few ideas and um, 
kind of energized us to solve uh, the issues that we have uh, been discussing. So I think that um, it has served its purpose. Kevin, I think I think you did what you came to do <laughs> and um, have given us the motivation to continue and of course, um, make New Harmony uh, what it is. So we are a little bit over. Um, so of course, if you guys have any other questions or maybe you want to make another comment that you did, just didn't get to, um, feel free to reach out to any of the Historic New Harmony team um, and we'd be happy um, to answer. And Kevin also just put his email address in the chat. I was going to ask you to do that and you got ahead of me. <laughs> uh, so I, I just have May I ask Kevin oh, yeah. one question before? Of course. We... Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you have any roadmaps or resources mm -hmm. toward how you get a synergi synergistic conversation happening in a community. Um, there's a few that that I have at the end of my slides here. Um, uh, the Indiana, am I sharing? Oh, I shared my screen. I can stop share. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, oh, where, no, I'm lost in Zoom. Sorry. Um, there's a there's a creative placemaking toolkit uh, from the Indiana Arts Commission uh, that they have on their on their website. Um, uh, and just kind of, or I can I can send the links to to Claire. Um, uh, but it's just just uh, so they have some. Uh, some toolkits there for community engagement, community building, um, asset mapping, and, and funding sources. Um, um, and, you know, probably connecting with the regional arts partner down there, Arts Council of Southwestern Indiana. Um, uh, you know, the National Endowment for the Arts has a few things. Um, art Place America. Um, and you guys probably know some of these, like Historic Landmarks or, or Okra. Um, you know, Patronicity uh, is, is doing some of this work uh, in funding. Oh yeah, and then, so there's the Our Town Grants, which is a great model from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, the Kresge Arts and Culture Program um, has some things. And then there's probably a couple things I would add to this, uh, which is Springboard for the Arts. Uh, they're an organization um, uh, in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. Uh, they're doing a lot of things in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but they've also branched out and they really kind of turned into a statewide organization. Uh, and they just came out with um, quite a few toolkits um, that, 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 that get at this. Uh, but in some ways, you know, kind of for the visioning process, you know, a lot of that comes out of community building, um, organizing that background, um, you know, that, that artists can use, but that there's probably other uh, other sources in that realm uh, that, that some of them are in the in the quotes um, uh, that um, uh, are in the chat that, that have some of that information as well. But a lot of it's just getting people together and talking and, and, and you know, the whiteboarding or post-it noting or, or those kinds of things. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna put my screen back up there. Uh, so thank you uh, very much, Kevin, for joining us this evening. Um, thank you for being flexible. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, this is a lot uh, later than we had originally planned, but we're uh, grateful that you were still able to join us, um, uh, even if it was virtually. Uh, also, thank you to uh, the Mason North Gower Family Gallery um, that did uh, sponsor this program, as well as Indiana Humanities, um, uh, of course, for the uh, Speakers Bureau that Kevin uh, hails from. Uh, so just a few things. Um, we do have one last Crossroads speaker uh, scheduled. Uh, this one was actually um, supposed to happen a few weeks ago, um, but we had unknowingly scheduled it uh, with the last presidential debate. Um, and we, we knew that that was not gonna work. Uh, so Lisa and the h, &H team um, decided to reschedule it for Thursday, January 28th at 6.30. Um, and Lisa is a, a USI uh, uh, adjunct um, and she is presenting We Never Leave Home. Uh, she is in the English department and she'll be uh, talking about how uh, her uh, you know, upbringing in Indiana um, kind of uh, uh, informed everything that she read and observed in um, some of the great literature. So uh, an another great presentation uh, coming up. 
Of course, uh, we have several holidays before then. Uh, so everyone have a happy Thanksgiving um, and enjoy uh, your Christmas. Finally, um, stay connected with us. Um, we do have a monthly e-newsletter. Uh, we sent out our uh, November edition last week uh, and you can uh, subscribe to that at usi.edu forward slash in harmony or on our Facebook page. We do have a pinned post at the top that'll to lead you to um, our subscription page as well. And then we are on social media and there are is there is our Facebook, Instagram and Twitter uh, accounts as well. And finally, if you uh, want to uh, see more from the Crossroads Speaker Series, uh, you can go to usi.edu forward slash Crossroads Speakers. All of our previous uh, presentations are linked there and then you can see um, Kevin's as soon as we get it up. And then of course, read more about Lisa's presentation in January. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you so much uh, for everyone joining us today, and I hope that you all have a wonderful evening and a happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Glad to do it. Great to talk with you all.